of scientific socialism, to be more precise, is a synthesis of three main, stra three main strands of thought. That is to say, of the, the analysis and an understanding of particularly French class politics, the class struggle in France in the latter part of the 18th century, the first half of the 19th century, combined with English economics, that is to say, the study of the first capitalist economic system, the first capitalist economic system which developed in a mature way in Europe, and German philosophy. And particularly, in this session, what I think we want to get to grips with are the fundamental ideas, the fundamental philosophical ideas of Marxism, the third strand that led to the development of scientific socialism. And the basis of Marxist philosophy is dialectical materialism. And whilst we don't want to vulgarize and uh, perhaps present too simplistic a, an idea of what dialectical materialism represents, we shouldn't nevertheless be afraid of what it represents. We shouldn't actually be intimidated by the expression. We shouldn't be intimidated by the idea of Marxist philosophy as such. All of us, militant supporters, particularly within the movement, who read the newspaper militant, who read the magazines and the, the documents of the militant tendency, all of us have no doubt have approached many social and political problems from a dialectical point of view without necessarily understanding that we actually are using a dialectical method. I'm quite sure all of the comrades here have been involved in political discussions in which it's been said many times that society is in a state of flux, that society is in a state of motion, that nothing stands still in society, nothing stands still in nature. And really that, if you like, is the application in a simplified form of dialectical materialism. Dialectics, if you like, dialectics is the logic of motion. And dialectical materialism is specifically the logic of the motion of matter. And I think we'll find that dialectical materialism, that approach, to, approach towards philosophy, is the only philosophical method which is not only consistent with the material world, it's not only consistent with nature, but it's also consistent with itself. The dialectical method, the dialectical materialist method, actually even is useful in describing the origins of itself, in describe the, des describing the origins of dialectical materialism, of philosophy and Marxist philosophy at that. But I think we should begin by saying that the basis of that, the basis of dialectical materialism is materialism it's itself. Marxism is fundamentally founded upon materialism. <coughs> And many of the ideas that Marx and Engels developed, they developed from the materialist philosophers, particularly Feuerbach, a materialist philosopher who was a contemporary of Marx and Engels. And they, they, based their, they based their philosophy fundamentally on materialism. What is a materialist outlook? Well, materialism, of course, is the opposite, opposite to idealism. A materialist puts forward the view that matter is the essence of reality. That phenomena, that existence, that reality can be explained on the basis of material things and material explanations as opposed to explanations that are based upon supernatural forces, upon gods, spirits, things that go bump in the night. And uh, to put it uh, in another way, the way Feuerbach put it, being creates thought. In other words, you cannot have thought without being. You cannot have the mind, you cannot have ideas without material existence upon which it must be based. Whereas the idealists interpret history, interpret social development in the other way around. They interpret the development of mankind, the development of society, the development of history and so on from the point of view of the mind, from the point of view of the human spirit, with a capital S, from the point of view of the human ideal, from the point of view of idealism in general. It's not always possible, of course, to be a consistent idealist. Many of the idealists themselves feel like jumbled up materialist ideas with idealistic ideas. In fact, materialism really invades into our lives every single day, every single minute that we are alive. We cannot avoid the process of ingestion of food and so on. We cannot avoid a position, a situation 
where we use material things and we base our lives upon material things. It's all very well for the idealists to put forward the idea that nothing exists in reality except in our mind. But the idealists themselves actually order their own lives and conduct their own business as if matters were different. They, in other, uh, in other words, they organize their own existence. They go to bed having prepared the morning's breakfast, knowing full well that the sun will rise in the morning just as surely as the sun sets in the following evening. In other words, they operate their lives on the basis that material existence uh, is there, that reality is there, irrespective of what is in their mind. So, in actual fact, you cannot get, in any case, a consistent idealist approach towards philosophy. In fact, many of the philosophers and scientists in the 17th, 18th and 19th century, well, even in the, in the modern era, as a matter of fact, are really hybrids of materialists and idealists at the same time. You had, for example, the development of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the revolution and evolution, which was uh, created by Darwin. And Darwin's approach towards, towards the explanation and the origin of the species was undoubtedly a materialist approach. He, dry, he tried to describe the origin of species on the basis of development, on the basis of physical development, a materialist approach, you might say. But nevertheless, Darwin himself saw that the Creator saw that, if you like, spiritual, spiritual uh, causes were behind the process of evolution himself. His ideas, and he represented a hybrid of both idealistic and materialistic ideas at one and the same time. Whereas materialist ideas have very largely come to dominate as far as the natural sciences are concerned, as far as chemistry, physics, biology, and these sciences are concerned, nevertheless idealistic ideas still unfortunately dominate as far as many of the social sciences are concerned, as far as politics, sociology and history are concerned. I think we all know and we all have had examples for, uh, of, uh, of history being taught not in terms of material development, not in terms of the development of production or the development of the material things within society. But I'm sure we've all heard and witnessed and experienced history taught in terms of kings and queens in terms, if you like, of the ideals of what goes on in the minds of men and women and particular figures within history, as if the development of mankind, as if the development of society was based upon the continual improvement and the continual perfection of the ideas that were in the minds of the men and women who actually made history. And you have, even in sociology and politics, idealism, if you like, as a dominant force, particularly as far as capitalist norms are concerned. The idea, for example, that, uh, that uh, capitalism is a natural form of, uh, of running society because, of course, of the natural innate greed that exists within our minds. The idea, if you like, that instinct, that some kind of innate greed, some kind of innate idea is the basis upon which capitalism actually exists and all other class societies exist. And really that is an example, if you like, of how an idealistic approach, completely idealistic approach, actually dominates within the sphere of the social sciences. So Marxism then, and I, I, I hope in relation particularly to social questions to amplify that point in a moment, Marxism bases itself upon a materialist foundation. In the words of Marx, the environment determines the consciousness. You cannot have thought, you cannot have mind, you cannot have ideals, you cannot have ideas, you cannot have any of these things except on the basis of material reality, except on the basis of concrete material reality. So that describes, in a nutshell, if you like, materialism. But dialectics, of course, is another important aspect of scientific socialism. It's perhaps best to describe what dialectics refers to, the idea of dialectical logic, if we first of all describe what dialectics is not. Dialectics is a contradiction of formal logic. And formal logic, perhaps, we should go into. Formal logic is something that we probably all recognize, that we take for granted, that is often, is often uh, referred to as, if you like, common sense. And formal logic simply states that A equals A, to use the most commonly used example, that a pound of sugar is equal to a pound of sugar. That is the basic law of identity upon which formal logic is based. There are other laws of formal logic, but they're all based upon that fundamental law of identity. And within the realm of formal logic, there is no room for contradiction. And things are generally expressed as absolute 
and categorical statements. A equals A. There cannot be any contradiction in that. A cannot be anything else but A. A cannot equal to B. And of course that has its parallel in, uh, in, the, in the natural sciences. That has its parallel in, in uh, elementary mathematics. We couldn't operate, certainly we couldn't have learnt mathematics at, uh, at a lower school level without understanding that 1 equals 1 and 2 equals 2. And uh, if we happened to put that 2 equals 3, that would have been a contradiction of formal logic, so to speak. And elementary geometry, elementary algebra, elementary uh, arithmetic is all based upon the idea of formal logic, the idea of the law of identity. But we can also see that the development of the material sciences, the development of natural sciences, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, also based themselves upon formal logic. They have, if you like, expressed themselves on the basis of formal logic. You have, again, to take an example, you have the example of the, the Linnaeus system of binomial nomenclature. I always get them mixed up. That is to say, the system was originated by the Swedish scientist of classifying all living matter on the basis on the basis of particular classes, particular orders, families, genera, and species, and so on. So we are in the class of mammalia, we're mammals, we're in the order of primates, we're in the family of uh, uh, hominids, I believe, along with apes and various other things, we're in the genera of homo, and we're uh, a particular species, homo sapiens. And that actual classification of all living things into the development of, uh, into particular categories, into particular species. That represented an enormous advance upon science. That allowed scientists to be able to categorize, to be able to, if you like, sort out the different classes, the different orders and the suborders within various species and so on. And every single living species has its own particular binomial name, its own particular name, Homo sapiens, Musca domestica for the common house fly, Lupus lupus for the wolf and all sorts of all sorts of uh, many other examples. That represented an enormous development, if you like, in scientific thinking. That was a materialist approach towards scientific thinking. But you can also see that it's a very formal approach. Linnaeus actually believed that if you added up all of the total number of species that exist within society, that number of species was exactly the same in the 18th century when he lived as it had been at the time of creation when God created those species. In other words, the species were complete, completely distinct, completely separate, completely indivisible, one upon another. We know, of course, that now that is uh, uh, completely wrong. A formal approach towards science is also perhaps exemplified by Dalton's atomic law. Dalton, the, the development of the atomic theory was a very important milestone in the, in, in the development of science. And Dalton's atomic theory put forward the idea that all matter is composed of uh, discrete and indivisible particles called atoms. And atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. And if you like, in terms of uh, atomic elements, in terms of uh, chemistry, Dalton explained uh, material existence in the same way that Linnaeus explained the existence of living things. Dalton classified atoms into, uh, into a fixed uh, category, a fixed inflexible group of atoms and so on. And in social sciences also, formal logic is important. We don't jettison formal logic in social sciences any more than we do actually in the physical sciences. It is important for us to realize, for example, that society isn't composed, British society, to take a more specific example, isn't composed of 50 million individuals, 50 million heterogeneous individuals without any kind of relationship, without any kind of special patterns, without any spe special kind of groups or social elements or social structures within society. It is necessary for us to recognize that within and among those 50 million individuals, there are important categories, there are classes, there are, if you like, uh, uh, representatives of political parties, there are, if you like, even subdivisions within the classes themselves. We recognize the existence of these classes, and that, in a sense, is again an expression of formal logic. But we can also see from these same examples, actually, we can see the limitations of formal logic, that nothing in society, nothing in nature, is completely fixed, completely stagnant, completely unchanged. Nature, reality, society, politics, mankind, all of these things are in a state of constant flux. They're in a state of constant change and constant development. And it was really this development 
Remember what I said earlier on, that dialectics is the logic of processes, it was the logic of motion. It was this development, if you like, which marked off the difference between a dialectical approach towards social and natural questions and a formal approach. We know, of course, that the system devised by Linnaeus was supplanted by the idea of evolution, that there isn't in actual fact a completely fixed and inflexible categorization of living things. We know that evolution takes place and we know that Homo sapiens developed as a species from earlier species. We know that earlier species that existed developed, perhaps died out and were transformed into different species. We also know now that Dalton's atomic theory, which whilst it obviously was and remains a useful theory, nevertheless Dalton's atomic theory has its limitations. We know that it's possible on the basis of certain physical conditions to actually uh, transform one kind of atom, to create one kind of element from another kind of element, for atoms to be transformed into other kinds of atoms. And dialectics, if you like, is the logic that describes the processes, it describes the motion, the form of motion that actually takes place. Dialectical logic puts forward the idea, whereas formal, the former logicians say, well, A equals A, a pound of sugar equals a pound of sugar. The dialecticians will say, well, A is not equal to A, a pound of sugar is not equal to a pound of sugar. And uh, Trotsky described that uh, uh, in, in, in defense of Marxism in the following way, that if you examine that particular expression, A equals A, well, you can easily say, well, well, A is not equal to A by examining the letters under a microscope. If you compare one letter A to another letter A, there will be some small, perhaps, microscopical detail in the typographical setup of the two letters, and one will have a slightly different, slightly longer leg than the other, or a slightly shorter stem in the middle than the other, so those two letters aren't identical. And even if you look at one of the letters, that letter is not equal to itself, because if you look at it at one moment, it may contain a certain, uh, certain constitution, a certain uh, composition on the basis of the various uh, chemical molecules that make up the ink, and then within a matter of moments after that, the composition of that letter has changed because of the deterioration that has taken place in the chemical composition of the ink, because of the physical and the chemical deterioration that's taken place on the paper itself. So the letter, from a typographical point of view, the letter is not equal to the letter. But now there is a pound of sugar equal to a pound of sugar, because no particular scale exists, no particular set of balances or measuring device exists, which can actually absolutely perfectly devise a situation where one pound of sugar can be uh, measured exactly against another pound of sugar. When we talk about a pound of sugar, if you like, we talk in reality about an approximation, and only an approximation. And once again, if you take only one pound of sugar, you can't say that that pound of sugar is equal to itself. Again, because of the fact that the examination of one pound of sugar from one second to the next would demonstrate that some of the molecules of sugar had decomposed, some of them had become oxidized, some of them are now floating about in the air in the form of carbon dioxide and other gases and so on. And perhaps other, other molecules had been attached, attached themselves to the sugar. So the pound of sugar isn't a fixed, a constant, an inflexible thing. A pound of sugar, in actual fact, is a, is a, is a process in and of itself. So we, we, we get to the position then where in actual fact, formal logic becomes only an approximation. Formal logic is a useful approximation. It's a useful device, it's a useful tool, but nevertheless we have to be able to describe, we have to be able to understand the processes, the actual development that takes place. And it's obviously the examples that we use in relation to natural sciences and physical sciences are perhaps a little bit easier to get a hold of. But dialectics finds its, its best expression, it finds its most useful expression, not so much in the natural sciences, but as far as we are concerned, in the social sciences, in the, in the sphere of politics, in the sphere of economics, in the sphere of uh, social development, and so on. The three fundamental laws of dialectics, the three fundamental laws that describe motion, or the laws, and I'll go into them in uh, detail, I'll mention them, are the law of the transformation of quantity into quality, the law of the negation of the negation, and the law of the interpenetration of opposites. Again, you shouldn't be intimidated by the, uh, those particular expressions. You have to bear in mind that some of these expressions are kind of technical expressions. Some of these expressions are, if you like, the jargon of philosophers. 
and in actual fact the concept the concepts behind the expressions aren't necessarily as complicated as they sound well the law of the transformation of quantity into quality it really if you like describes in a little bit more detail the way development takes place dialectics is a law of development a law of process a law of change but that doesn't necessarily mean that change and development always follows a naturally smooth and gradual and evolutionary path. On the contrary, again, you've probably heard the expression used in many militant meetings. Nothing in nature, nothing in society moves in a smooth and easy straight line. On the contrary, development proceeds on the basis of periods of evolutionary development, periods of gradual change, combined with revolutionary change, combined with leaps, combined with enormous qualitative changes. And really that particular law, the law of transformation, quantity and equality, describes a combination of those two forms of development. It des describes the fact that quantitative changes, gradual changes, evolutionary changes, build up contradictions and build up processes which eventually have to express themselves in leaps and revolutionary changes and qualitative changes. Quantitative development creates contradictions which give rise to qualitative changes. You can give the example again in relation to natural sciences. You can say, for example, if you take a body of water, if you take a quantity of water like that, if you add energy to that, if you add energy to that, particularly as far as, as, far as heat energy is concerned, then there will be a quantitative change. You can measure the quantitative change in its temperature. There's a quantitative change between water at 10 degrees centigrade and water at 20 degrees centigrade. There's a similar quantitative change between 20 and 30, 30 and 40. But when you get up to 100 degrees centigrade, the contradictions have reached a critical point. A contradiction develops between the energy that you have provided to the water molecules, the fact that the water molecules are moving and vibrating at, uh, in a more energetic way than they were at 10 degrees. There's a contradiction between that and the forces that actually bind the water molecules together. So whereas from 10 to 100 degrees centigrade, there is a quantitative change. You add energy. All you're doing is adding energy. There is a quantitative change in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the structure of the water, a quantitative change in the nature of the water. When you reach 100 degrees centigrade, that quantitative change becomes a qualitative change. Because of the contradiction that has developed, it is no longer possible for the water to maintain its fluid form. The water assumes a gaseous form. In other words, the water actually changes into steam. And you can see many examples, if you like, in the physical world, in the, in the natural sciences, that describe the law of the transformation of quantity into, uh, in, into quality. The same applies, for example, to pregnancy. From the, from the time of conception to the, to the ninth month, month of pregnancy, there's a, a quantitative change, you might say, in the development of the unborn child. There's a quantitative change. But eventually, at the ninth month, a contradiction develops between the weight of the child itself, between the fact of its own maturity, its actual weight, its physical needs. That now comes into contradiction with the ability of the mother, with the ability of the, the, the parent body to support that child with its weight and its physical needs and so on. So a quantitative change becomes, if you like, a qualitative change. And the same applies within society as a whole. If you like, revolutions. Revolutions express the birth, but the development of revolution expresses the period of pregnancy. And we can see in relation to social development, we can see the way in which quantitative changes give way to qualitative changes. Wars, revolutions and social upheavals are part and parcel of the necessary social and political development of mankind. But these haven't taken place, if you like, spontaneously. These haven't taken place uh, without any kind of basis or any kind of formation behind them. These have taken place on the, on, on, on the basis of the gradual development, if you like, of contradictions within society. It may be, for example, that in the attitudes that workers have, that workers are forced because of circumstances to become more militant in an industrial sense, to be more likely or more prone to take industrial action, to, uh, to uh, operate go slows, to operate overtime bans or what have you. In the course of four or five or ten years of social development. There is a quantitative change, a gradual quantitative change, a relatively gradual quantitative change in the attitudes, in the consciousness of the workers themselves. But there would also come a point within society where the contradictions reach such a point 
that if you like there is a qualitative change in the attitude there is a qualitative change in the consciousness and whereas the attitudes previous to that meant increasing likelihood of strikes increasing militancy on the industrial plane a qualitative change towards a revolutionary consciousness expresses in actual fact a completely different attitude there may be fewer strikes there may be less industrial activity but the militancy the activity the aspirations of those workers are now expressed in a completely different fashion they're expressed if you like in a political and a revolutionary political fashion but that couldn't have happened that development could not have taken place a qualitative leap in consciousness in attitude couldn't have taken place without the quantitative development that had taken place the development of contradictions the growth of contradictions the growth if you like of, uh, of social problems within society up to that particular time so that describes the law of the transformation of quantity into quality the law of the negation of the negation is really only a further development of that negation in philosophical terms means simply the passing away of something and the law of the negation of the negation describes the fact that where there is a change brought about a qualitative change brought about so a new system is created a new situation is created the law of the negation says simply that that, that negation that new system it is a negation in the sense that it has caused the previous position or the previous situation to pass away but that negation will itself be negated by further development by further social change by further further transformations from quantity into quality again you can see this you can see examples of this if you like as far as the natural sciences are concerned the development of, uh, of land animals meant the development of the uh, uh, skeletons of fishes to an extent that limbs were developed for example and you could say that in a qualitative sense the development of limbs to enable animals to walk about on land the development of limbs negated the existence of fins that represented an actual qualitative change in the structure in the function of the skeletons of those two animals but nevertheless certain mammals certain land animals later in their path of evolution moved back towards the development of fins again of course whales porpoises and animals of this kind if you like developed the contrary the contrary process of evolution so you had the negation of the negation the previous development was negated by further development the same is the case in relation to social development we could say for example that the development of class society was an enormously progressive development for humanity because class society could not have come into being without a situation in which mankind had learned to conquer nature to such an extent that at least a certain element of mankind was able to live of the of the labor of the productivity of the rest that a certain class was able to live of the labor power of the rest and obviously that couldn't happen in a position where mankind was chasing every nut and every berry he could lay his hands on or every wild animal to eat or every other man he could get, get his hold of uh, get a hold of to eat on the basis of savagery on the basis of that kind of an existence class society is impossible so class society meant necessarily the development if you like of agriculture a settled development the development of technique the development of uh, of science even to the extent that that man had become uh, to a point where he he was beginning to conquer nature he was beginning to to uh, to put nature at his own disposal and of course that that represented a tremendous development for mankind the first class societies represented a, a human development human progress in relation to the previous societies that existed but we would also say that class society at the present time is of course an obstacle it's a feather on the development of mankind the existence of a position where you have private expropriation of the the surplus produce the existence within society of classes these things now represent an obstacle a feather on the development of science on the development of technique on the development of production and so on and socialism socialism a worker state is if you like the beginning of a developed society in which classes would no longer exist from within the womb of capitalism from within the womb of class society the proletariat the working class is if you like the class of the future and in abolishing capitalism the working class in a historic sense would abolish class society there is no justification on the basis of science and technique 
on the basis of the productive forces of mankind. There is no longer any justification, any historical justification for the existence of classes. And so you can see the negation of the negation. Class society negated the previous existence, the previous, the, the previous order of things as far as mankind is concerned. You can see the same examples, the same kind of examples in relation to many other, uh, many other particular concepts. The idea, for example, of uh, the nation state also. The nation state, the development of the nation state was a progressive factor in the years of the development of capitalism, particularly in Europe in the last century and in the, uh, in the, in the uh, 18th century. But nevertheless, there comes a point where the nation state itself becomes a threat upon the development of production, upon the development of mankind, and so on. The third law of dialectics is the law of the interpenetration of opposites. And again, that is, if you like, is tied up, it's very intimately connected with the other two laws of dialectics. The law of the interpenetration of opposites, again, describes the fact that where processes take place, they take place because of contradictions, because of opposites, because of a position, if you like, where opposites exist at the same time, in the same place, and within the same system. All, all processes have two sides to them, if you like. Whereas, in, the, in, in the, the laws of formal logic, contradiction is an impossibility. In the laws of dialectics, contradiction is an essential part of the development process itself. And again, you can give examples in, in the natural world, in natural sciences. It's impossible to have the, uh, the concept of, uh, of a positive field in, uh, in uh, magnetism or in uh, 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 elect a positive electrical field without the concept of a negative field. It's impossible to have the concept of a, a north pole uh, of a magnet without the idea of a south pole. It's impossible to actually envisage the idea of uh, life as far as an individual is concerned without also the idea of death. In the very act of being alive, we are also at one and the same time slowly dying, not a very, uh, not a very uh, pleasing thought, but in actual fact it, it, it is true from the very beginning, like of your life, you're uh, uh, also, if you like, doomed, you're also in the process of death. And we can see the same kind of contradictions as far as social and political matters are concerned. A formalist, a formalist always sees one side of social things, they always see one side of political developments. But they never see the contradictory side, they never see two sides of social development. So that, for example, in relation to the USSR, in relation to the deformed worker states of Eastern Europe, a Marxist can see, at one and the same time, the fact that there are enormously progressive elements within society in Eastern Europe. That is to say, the development of the economy, the development of the plan of production, the, the state ownership of, of the economy and so on. But at the same time, we can also see the negative side, the regressive, the reactionary side within those same societies, the existence of a bureaucracy, the existence of a totalitarian police state. And, you know, it's not unnatural, it's not unknown. I'm sure all of the comrades here again can give examples of the formalists within the labor movement who look, if you like, at the USSR, look at Eastern Europe, either from a completely positive point of view or from, or, or from a completely negative point of view without understanding the contradictions that exist within the development of that one particular situation. The same applies, for example, in relation to the development of the revolutionary movement at this very moment in, uh, in the Middle East, in Iran, for example. The formalist would have the point of view either, either that the revolutionary movement in Iran is 100% uh, progressive, we have to accept if you like, all of, the, uh, all of the different elements of that revolution is progressive. All the formalists might say, well, that revolution is a completely reactionary movement. That's the point of view that was put forward, if you remember, by Owen and by James Callaghan only a matter of 18 months or two years ago. But of course, a Marxist can see within that same movement contradictory features, positive and negative features, opposing features within that same revolutionary movement. We can see, if you like, the negative features, the theocratic ideas of Khomeini, the reactionary attitude towards women, towards democratic rights, towards the rights of organization, the independent organization of workers. But you can also see the enormous revolutionary features, the enormous revolutionary positive elements within that movement itself. 
The fact that that movement represents a movement of, 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 of millions, or hundreds of thousands of workers, even the, the Mullahs and Khomeini himself had to admit that their revolution was the revolution of the barefooted ones. That is to say, it was a movement that represented the aspirations, it represented the, the feelings and the needs of hundreds of thousands and millions of the masses as far as Iran is concerned. And that was the basis for the overthrow of the Shah's regime, for the strikes that took place in the oil industry and in other industries and so on. But if you like looking at the contradictory sides of that one movement, to understand the relationship between the contradictory sides, is something that's done only on the basis of a Marxist a dialectical point of view, which if you remember, which demonstrates uh, what I said earlier on, that many of us here use dialectical, uh, a dialectical approach. We use the dialectical method often without even actually understanding, without actually necessarily realizing that we're using a dialectical method. The same applies to the development of the British labor movement. We've said many times in the pages of Militant and the MIR that the post-war development of the labor movement in the 50s and 60s, in one sense, represented a degeneration of the labor movement in the sense that the ideas of Gaitskill, the ideas of Bill Rogers, the ideas of uh, Douglas J, the ideas of Roy Jenkins, these people came to dominate the Labour Party and the ideas of their equivalent in the trade union field, the Collins, the Deacons and so on, came, came to dominate the Labour movement in the trade union field. So in a sense, the Labour movement degenerated. But we've also said in meetings that the post-war period has seen an enormous strengthening of the labour movement in terms of its social development, in terms of its social position within society. Now the formalist would say, well hang on a minute, only five minutes ago you said the labour movement was weakened. But in actual fact, there if you like, is a contradiction. It is a fact that in one sense the labour movement was weakened. In a different sense, the labour movement was strengthened. The labour movement, if you like, in its own development in the post-war period, demonstrated contradictory features. It demonstrated contradictions within itself. And of course, eventually, eventually that contradiction would, would, uh, would create changes, could create, would create qualitative changes in the leadership, qualitative changes in the structure of the labor movement itself. The development of the social strength, the development of the industrial strength of the trade union movement would come into conflict with the old ideas of the bureaucracy the old ideas of the gate skills, the old ideas of the deacons, and we might add, as far as the future is concerned, the chapels, the duffies, and so on. And a new situation would develop, a qualitative change would take place within society. Dialectic, and the, the method of dialectical materialism has found its way, it's invaded its way into most of the natural sciences at the present time. It's very difficult to be a botanist or to be a chemist and not actually approach things from a dialectical point of view. And again, uh, those who had any kind of scientific training will realize that the, if you like, in a, not necessarily, with, not, without necessarily using the words dialectics or the dialectical materialism, the way science is taught, at least uh, uh, at an advanced level, is actually accepts many of the ideas of dialectics, the ideas that laws, Boyle's Gatter's laws, Dalton's law, uh, all of these things really aren't fixed finite absolute laws that, that at the fringes there's always exceptions, there's always the possibility to find to like weaknesses within the laws themselves. But within, within the social sciences, within politics, within economics, formalist attitudes, formal attitudes still dominate as far as capitalist society is concerned. Marxists still have to debate, still have to argue and oppose a dialectical approach to a formalist approach as far as the development of social and, uh, and, uh, and uh, economic sciences are concerned. I should say that we don't, of course, we don't jettison the idea of formal logic. Formal logic isn't abandoned. We couldn't do without formal logic. But formal logic is now only an, an approximation. Formal logic becomes, if you like, secondary to dialectical, uh, dialectical logic. To take the example of classes, I use the example uh, as far as formal logic is concerned, that it's necessary for a worker to realize his own class position. It's actually a progressive thing, a progressive development for a worker to realize that he's not one of 50 million people within British society, 
but he is part of a class with definite class interests, with definite class uh, aspirations, and with, uh, if you like, part and parcel of a definite class struggle. That, if you like, is, a, is a, an expression of formal logic. But of course, we would add to that the idea that even within classes, there are, if you like, changes, there are alterations in moods, there are alterations in attitudes, alterations in temperament and so on. And we would distinguish even between classes, between groups of workers or groups of capitalists, we would distinguish the fact that there are sometimes opposing interests, sometimes contradictory interests, sometimes simultaneous interests. So if you like, a dialectical logic, a dialectical approach is an addition to a formal approach. We don't abandon in mathematics the idea that 1 equals 1 and 2 equals 2. That's still the basis of mathematics right up to the age of 14 or 15. But the development of calculus, the development, if you like, of a dialectical form of mathematics, if you like, supersedes that. It is a further development of mathematics itself. The great, of course, the great contribution that Marx and Engels made wasn't only to develop the ideas of dialectical materialism. They took the idea of dialectics from Hegel. Hegel, the German philosopher, who was himself an idealist. He didn't, if you like, find a way of applying his dialectical logic to reality, to society, to actually the development of natural things. They took the dialectics of Hegel, they took the materialism of Feuerbach, and they put the two together and developed dialectical materialism. But this synthesis wasn't only left, if you like, in the realm of natural sciences, or in the realm of philosophy. The great contribution that Marx and Engels made was in the application of dialectical materialism to society, to history, to the development of politics itself. And that's what's commonly referred to as historical materialism. Marx and Engels applied this method to the development of history, to the development of classes, to the development of society itself. What is historical materialism? Well, the idea of historical materialism is fundamentally the idea that laws, that philosophy, that art, that science, that the classes that exist within society, that the laws that govern the relationship of those classes, that the political parties that represent those classes, that all of these things are a reflection the like of the period of economic development that social man is at at that any one particular time in his development. That the forces of production, the way in which mankind has learned, or the way in which mankind has yet to learn, the development of the means of production, the way in which mankind organizes the production of the necessities of life. These are the fundamental motive forces within history. So that it wouldn't be possible to develop certain ideas in art, or certain ideas in science, or even certain class structures within society, except on the basis, except on the basis of a certain material development of the production forces. And that's the fundamental idea, the fundamental uh, basis of historical materialism. So if you take, for example, the idea of Cromwell, the idea is put forward even now, that Cromwell, of course, initiated the English Revolution because he saw a crusade, a necessary crusade, against the church, the established church in England at that particular time. And that was why we had a revolution. Of course, we know that's different. We know that's not the case. We know that the Cromwell, the movement of Cromwell, in actual fact represented, it was the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, it represented a much more fundamental movement that was taking place within society. Before Cromwell was born, you had the development, the beginnings of capitalist society developing within the womb of feudalism. You had the development of trade, the development of, uh, of, uh, of commerce, the development of manufacturing, and the development, if you like, of the spirit of the entrepreneur, the spirit of the entrepreneur, the spirit of, uh, the spirit of uh, independence, the spirit of democracy, came into conflict with feudalism, not only in the, in the, in the sphere of production, not only in the sphere of economics, but also necessarily in the sphere of law, in the sphere of religion, in the sphere of morals, and so on. And the movement of Cromwell, and we could also say the Protestant movement generally, the reformist movement generally, was, if you like, the representation in a social sense, the representation in a, in a legal sense, a religious sense, of an economic development that was taking place within society. As Trotsky pointed out, 
by the time of the English Revolution. In actual fact, the House of Commons was already four times wealthier than the House of Lords. And that, if you like, describes in a nutshell the economic developments that had taken place at that particular time. And it doesn't matter what's in the minds, really, of Cromwell. It doesn't matter what's in the mind of any of these particular figures in history. It doesn't matter about that. The fact of the matter is that the fundamental thing, the fundamental motor force of history is the, 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 the forces of production, the forces of development themselves. The forces of production, if you like, create a position where they have to break through the legal restraints, the class restraints, sometimes the moral and the religious restraints that are imposed upon them within society. And they create, if you like, a superstructure of a legal system, of a political system, of a class system that corresponds to their own development. Just as capitalism, just as the process of the development of commerce, of trade, of manufacturing necessarily had to break through the old legal, moral, political, religious system of feudalism. So the, the development of capitalism itself has reached such a point, the forces of production, the potential of production of science and technique and so on, have reached such a point now where once again we would say the laws, the legal system, the class structure within capitalism, the political system within capitalism is now an absolute fetter upon the, upon the development of production and so on. We would have to break through the laws, the political system, the norms, if you like all of the old crap, the political superstructure of capitalism in order further to develop the means of production, in order further to develop a science and technique and so on. In the last analysis, the motor force of history are the productive forces themselves. The method of historical materialism even explains actually the development of philosophy and the development of dialectical materialism itself. For example, the development of philosophy, of Greek philosophy, wouldn't have been possible except on the basis of certain objective economic factors that existed at that particular time. Why is it that the first philosophers were not Greeks? and not Egyptians or Babylonians? And the answer to that question lies in the fact that it was only in the Greek city-states, in the Aegean, Ionian Greek city-states, that the economic and the objective circumstances existed for the development of philosophy, if you like, as, uh, as, uh, as a science. And even the, the division of the philosophers themselves into the materialist philosophers, the Greek materialists, and the Greek idealists, even this division could be expressed and explained in terms of the economic and the objective circumstances that existed so that the materialists, the Greek materialists, be like with the representation, they reflected the views of the, the traders, the, tra the independent city-states of Greece, the trading states with the necessary spirit of, uh, of the, the entrepreneur, much like the early capitalists, the spirit of uh, adventure, uh, shall we say, that was the that was the idea. If you like that was the reflection of their of their objective and economic circumstance. And necessarily, they, if you like, by the very fact that they were engaged in trade and commerce, they absorbed ideas, they absorbed traditions from many different areas of the Mediterranean. On the other hand, the ideas of the of the Greek idealists were really a reflection, if you like, of the reactionary elements. The, within Greek society, within the Greek slave societies particularly. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and the idealists in Greek society represented the conservative elements within the class struggle that was taking place within Greek society. And that's the basis, if you like. That's the reason why they, they, uh, that particular class found its reflection in idealism rather than in the material struggle itself. Socrates actually was sentenced to death. He was forced to commit suicide. Because, uh, on the basis of the class struggle uh, that, that, that was taking place within society at, at that time. So historical materialism is consistent within itself. It is, uh, has a consistency, not only with nature, not only with the development of society, but historical materialism describes also and actually explains the development of philosophy and the development of dialectical materialism. Scientific socialism, that came to be known as, as Marxism, could not have developed except on the basis of the material, objective conditions within society in the, uh, at the time of the last century. It could not have developed except on the basis of the maturity of the ideas, if you like, of German philosophy, the ideas of French politics, and the ideas of English economics 
which I mentioned uh, earlier on. Historical materialism, I should say, is a necessary, a, a necessary correction. It doesn't rule out the role of individuals in history. It doesn't rule out, if you like, the role of political activity in history. We shouldn't imagine that historical materialism dictates the position, if you like, of absolute fatalism, where society progresses, progresses naturally of its own volition. And therefore, there's no justification for political activity. There's no justification for us, for all, us all as individuals, playing a role within a political movement. There is a very, very important role, and a very, very significant role for individuals within history. It was pointed out in the uh, history of the Russian Revolution by Trotsky, that had it not been for the existence of Lenin, had it not been for Lenin's role in the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, in building the Bolshevik Party itself, it's unlikely that the Russian Revolution would have taken place, or, or to be more precise, it's unlikely that the October Revolution would have taken place, it's unlikely that the Bolshevik Revolution would have taken place. And you could say that the, the role of individuals in history isn't ruled out, but nevertheless they must play a role necessarily that is limited. They must play a role which is uh, uh, defined, if you like, by the limits of the objective, the material, the social conditions that apply at that particular time. At the same time, historical materialism doesn't rule out the, the need for individuals, the need for political activists to actually to play a part within society. Again, Marx himself pointed out that whereas, if you like, material things, material forces are the basis for social development, nevertheless, ideas themselves, political ideas, can actually attain a real material force providing those political ideas are implanted in the minds of the masses themselves, providing those political ideas, providing those ideas get sufficient support within society, then those ideas themselves can become a material force. If you like the ideas can then alter, can then alter the material existence. It can then alter the, 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 the forms of production, the processes of production and so on. We should say that Marx and Engels didn't actually invent socialism. I think his comrades are probably aware there were many before Marx and Engels who described themselves as socialists of one kind or another. But the enormous contribution that Marx and Engels made to socialism was to give socialism a scientific basis for the first time. The early socialists, if you like, were moralizers. The early socialists saw the, the idea, the, the benefit of an organized, harmonious, peaceful, classless society. But they based their political activity, they based, their, they based their analysis, so to speak, on the need to persuade the capitalists to give up their wealth, on the need to persuade workers to live side by side with capitalists and so on. They, if you like, had a completely utopian idea. People like Robert Owen, people like St. Fourier, people like this had a, a utopian idea of what socialism actually was and how socialism would come about. But Marx and Engels, for the first time, placed the idea of socialism in its correct historical, in its correct scientific context. And that was the basis, in their own words, for describing their system of ideas as scientific socialism. Capitalism created a revolution in science, in technology, in production, as far as mankind was concerned. Capitalism itself was a revolutionary development a few centuries ago. The development of the forces of production of capitalism necessarily destroyed the old legal system, the old norms, the old religious uh, setup and so on within, within feudal societies. But at the same time, capitalism itself contains the seeds of its own destruction. Capitalism could not develop except by the development of the working class. Capitalism could not develop except by the development of the capitalist class. And the, these two main classes within society the growth of these classes as the fundamental classes within society, if you like, express also the contradiction that would lead to the overthrow of capitalism itself. Necessarily, capitalism creates class struggle. Capitalism creates conflict between the two main contending forces within society. Capitalism contains in the working class, we might also add, of course, to that, in the development of science and technique and production, but capitalism contains within itself the seeds and the forces of its own destruction. So Marxism, the ideas of Marx and Engels, 
He liked provided the historical and the scientific justification for socialism in that context. If you look at the ideas of Marx himself as an individual, if you look at the ideas of scientific socialism, you can actually see a natural and progressive development in their ideas. You can see the way their ideas, if you like, matured, the way the ideas of socialism have matured. And perhaps I could finish on an expression that Marx himself used, which was eventually put on Marx's grave, which was really, uh, which really, uh, 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 if you like, typifies, it really signifies the expression that Marx himself reached after he had elaborated the theory of Marxism, the theory of scientific socialism, the expression was quite simply that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, and the point now is to change it.